Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. So this week's episode has been burning a hole in my podcast pocket for over a month, and I'm very pleased to finally be able to share it now that Dr. Raiden's book is available for purchase. If you listen to upwards of two podcasts in your life, you may in fact already be aware that Real Magic is out. Alex from Skeptico, giving the same amount of fucks for publishing schedules as he does for all puny human conventions, dropped his Dean Raiden album last week. And I woke up yesterday to see that Greg from THC also has his Raiden show out, which, you know, given that IE introduced them, is cold, Gregory, stone cold. The rest of us have to wait till podcast Thursday. Anyway, the book is something of an event, so I'm very happy to see it make a splash like this. So do definitely take a listen to Greg and Alex's conversations with Dr. Raiden. But speaking of, now it's time for ours. Dr. Raiden, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, congratulations on, you know, another absolute page turner of a book. Thank you. It's got, I'm I'm obviously very interested in how people put the history of magic uh, onto page, Uh, because usually if you're talking in this field or writing in this field, you have to give people context if they're coming to it cold. And at the beginning of your book, you do exactly that. And right. and it's an excellent job. It's this very punchy and brisk history of, well, we'll say Western magic, obviously, because, you know, that's specifically what we're talking about. And uh, right. one of the things that I thought uh, might be a good opener is uh, your analysis of hermeticism. So how is it not dualist as far as you can see? Well, it might be dualist. Um I think the I wasn't focusing on any one particular esoteric tradition. The, the idea was to see if there was an, an underlying thread that went through history, all the way from shamanism up to the present, that could provide clues about how magic might work. And the reason for that is, of course, I'm look, always looking for clues about how psychic phenomena might work. And so in the process of looking for these clues, uh, you, of course, immediately run into Hermeticism and all of the other esoteric traditions. And so I would say that uh, the this, the single commonality among all of them is the perennial philosophy. It is the, the idea that consciousness is fundamental in some way, or as a philosopher might put it, that idealism is a better model of reality than materialism. So... I, I didn't want to, I, in the process of reading a lot, I thought uh, I, I could understand why scholars can spend their entire lives studying the nuances between Hermeticism and Neoplatonism, as an example. But I decided to sidestep all of that simply because there's not enough room in a relatively small book to be able to do that justice. But I also think it's keenly observed, because you you hit the nail on the head, you uh You can have academics kind of looking at ever smaller nuances and ever smaller little canvases. And whilst Hermeticism is one of those words like Gnosticism or even Neoplatonism, that it's a kind of useful but also not useful grouping. Uh, I can see what I see it in there myself. I, I think, uh, you can certainly see Neoplatonic and, and Neoplatonic dualist influences, but it, it's kind of core is that, um, is that divine mind notion, isn't it? Right. Right. And so w- one of the things that I, I was really surprised about having not, I, I'm not a scholar of esotericism. Uh, I, I was diving into this somewhat naively, thinking that um, maybe after reading five books, I'd be a, a quasi-expert. And, and I discovered to my uh, shock and horror that there were hundreds of thousands of books, not not just from the, the ancient lore, all of the occult books, but even modern scholars who spend their lives doing this kind of uh, research. So I was under no illusions that I was going to find anything uh, deeper than what scholars have already written about in great gory detail. 
And instead, I'm writing for the person on the street who has heard something about the occult or likes to watch horror movies or something and doesn't really know very much about it. So it's, it's a shallow treatment from somebody who knows the history a lot, like perhaps you do. You probably know this a lot better than I do. But it's, it's just deep enough to get the sense that there's a huge amount of information that somebody could dive into if they thought that they really needed to. Well, I um, I would certainly wouldn't call it shallow. What I, I what I liked about it, and I like about the book in general, is obviously my wheelhouse is very much looking for uh, the the data points that you can use to kind of build a new uh, metaphysics. And it, it's interesting. I was talking to Dr. Kripal, who says hi, by the way, uh, yesterday uh, mm-hmm. about this, and it, you encounter it if you have an awareness of the reality of these phenomena in in some way, shape or form, and looking at the academic uh, treatment of it, that they're still kind of range bound by an implicit materialism. And uh, it was just, it, it, um, it was really exciting to see in this brisk and, and I wouldn't say shallow at all, but certainly accurate uh, treatment of the sort of history of magic slash esotericism in, in Europe for the last couple of thousand years is I see that there. I, I, I don't understand why that isn't the core of this, – this is a, a sort of bugbear of mine. I don't understand why that isn't the preeminent understanding of what hermeticism in aggregate is. It is a kind of – it's a divine mind model. You can get lost in all the different spheres and things that go up and down, but at its base, if you look in aggregate of its view of the universe, it is an animate mind. That's right. Nice one. Yeah, and it, it's it's true. Uh, I mean, Kabbalah is a reflection of Hermeticism, and Neoplatonism is, and all the way up to, in some respects, even positive psychology in academia today has elements of that. It has a strong overlay of materialism because that's the way that you have to behave if you're an academic. But if you begin to look below the surface, you you see these echoes going all the way back to f- at least fifty thousand years ago. And that, that was also surprising to me and actually kind of pleasant to see that you have these long underground traditions that still are popping up practically daily, not only in the academic world, but certainly in entertainment and, and fiction. Oh, absolutely. And you just mentioned the perennial philosophy. Now, one of the I'm, I want to ask you if this is a deliberate choice of phrasing, because in many respects, this attempted synthesis uh, that we're all kind of yourself and myself and, and other people in this space are uh, looking at has been attempted before. So um, if you look at, say, what you wrote about Blavatsky, I note that you um, said she claimed her synthesis revealed a set of perennial ideas. Now, mm-hmm. was the use of the word idea deliberate? Because are we starting, as I think we should, is, is the difference between the 21st century attempted synthesis and the 19th that we are looking at a baseline of experimental findings rather than a comparison of, of ideas? Well, yeah. So we, we are now in a realm, and maybe have been for at least 100 years, where we can start to do experiments to test whether the old ideas actually hold up to scrutiny. And that, that, in essence, is what I'm doing with this book. Because uh, up until somewhat recently, and, and I'm talking in historical terms recently, uh, there, there were experiments of the sort that uh, Alistair Crowley would talk about, and later Peter Carroll, of putting magical concepts to the test. And Blavatsky did this as well. And in fact, all of the, the great teachers at one point or another said, basically, test this. But now we have... We have laboratory methods, we have other rigorous approaches to be able to test whether these ancient ideas hold up to scrutiny. So my my specialty has been to look at these kinds of phenomena in the lab, but of course I use it in daily daily life as well. And that's that I think is the new element. And that's exactly what I was trying to bring out in the book. That we there you, you don't have to take anybody's word for what's going on, you can actually test it. Yeah, exactly. And I, so that's the bit I was looking for there. It's, it's, we can kind of, what Blavatsky did was look at overlaps of ideas in her comparison of the 19th century understanding of, say, Indian cosmologies and, and European ones and so on. And there were some overlaps and she worked with them and, and she definitely was a mystic who did the things that she spoke about, right? That's fine. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. But what we have at the moment is a kind of way of, 
um, passing some of those overlapped ideas through an almost evidential process. Uh, and, and then we can kind of a- almost build a slightly cleaned up perennial philosophy, if that makes sense. Yeah, we, we want to refine the techniques. That's what science is extremely good at. Uh, it, it's a sifting mechanism where we are able to test what works and what doesn't work. Unfortunately, it's also very strongly colored by culture. And I, I express some of the, the difficulties about uh, using scientific methods to test ancient ideas. And it's largely because the science as we think of it today is actually carved up into a number of disciplines. But there are certain disciplines that are missing. And in fact, it, it is explicitly the discipline of magic that is missing. It has something to do with these spaces between physics and psychology. And as a result, we, we can talk about parapsychology as a, about the only place that, that fits. And, but the parapsychology is way far out of the mainstream. So applying the tools of science, but then when you go for all the rest of it, where you get, uh, you get a robust peer review and you get other people trying to, to, to test your, your findings and so on, it exists, but it is, it is a very, very thin slice. And it, it's, not, it's both not deep enough and not wide enough in terms of how many people are involved in it to really almost be thought of as, as science, as the way it's conducted in other disciplines around the world. It's scientific methods, but the whole superstructure that makes science so powerful is still not quite there yet. No, and um, we'll we'll have some discussions about that a little bit later on. But what I want to do is talk about some of the, I guess, findings that uh, that have implications for this sifting method. So, for instance, tell us what happened to the meditators that Ion surveyed uh, and uh, regarding synchronicity and and their general lives. So, we're at one of our projects is on. Uh, what happens with advanced meditation research. Meditation research is now mainstream, and uh, I'm an editor of a journal, and practically every week I get a couple of papers on the use of mindfulness for this or for that, usually mental or physical health, but also now for things like uh, stress and students and stress in the hospital and all kinds of stuff. So we've gone from something which was considered the wackiest end of the esoteric world only about 30 or 40 years ago, into mainstream ho-hum, let's just do a study and publish it. Uh, That's a very fast turnaround. But what's missing from the meditation research world at this point, because they don't want to deal with the magical components of it, is that meditation has been used forever as a way of getting into the right kind of mental states to be able to do psychic and magical things. So we decided, well, that's that's a pity. So we did a, a survey, and we've, we've uh, worked with some advanced meditators to simply ask them what happens as what happens in your experience as a result of your practice. And these are typically people who are quite advanced. We asked them a bunch of questions, the usual mental and physical stuff, but we went beyond that into things like the cities, the, the yogic flavor of, of magic. Uh, and some, without naming it psychic, the kinds of experiences that people report that, that would be labeled psychic. And we found that basically 75% of both beginning and advanced meditators report that as a result of their practice, that they have experienced these things. Uh, so it, it's a secondary or a, a, an indirect way of showing that for people who are beginning this practice, and especially ones who move into it in more advanced ways, they simply bump up against the same kinds of phenomena that uh, Patanjali was writing about 2,000 years ago. So it, this was a way of showing that uh, there, there is something unusual about meditation that deserves research, and we, we are predicting, at least we're hoping at this point, that of all of the thousands of people around the world who are studying mindfulness and other forms of meditation, that they will eventually be brave enough to start asking the people that they're, that both the subjects that they're in their experiments and also people they're training, uh, what are they actually experiencing? 
and we expect that they're going to find what, exactly what we found. Roughly 75% will say, yeah, strange things are happening. There are, um, <clears throat> that would be great. Uh, there are also individual and almost immediate, I guess, practical implications, aren't there? What you're just saying is that 75% of people at a beginner and an advanced level uh, have an increase in meaningful coincidence or synchronicity in their lives from mindfulness meditation. So you can get an app on your phone after listening to this and do that for a couple of weeks daily and uh, and see what happens. Right. And of course, there's also talent is important. So some people will meditate for their entire lives and uh, maybe they'll be calmer, but they won't have these experiences. Whereas others will go to a weekend workshop of meditation and have a full-blown uh, kundalini experience or a psychotic break. So it, people are very different. Uh, fortunately, of, of all of the different training methods to get yourself in the right mental state, meditation is probably the safest yeah. and, and the, gen, the gentlest entree. So that's when people say, what should I do to, to get better at what I'm interested in? My answer always is, find a meditation technique that you will do, of which there are thousands. Find something that you'll do as a regular practice, and then just, just go with that. So, I mean, this will be speculation, but it, it does invite speculation. Uh, why? So, two, double question, why? Why does regular meditation result in, let's just say, meaningful coincidence, increased synchronicity? Uh, that's question one. And question two is, why does it only happen for 75% of the people? Like, how speculators to what that says about the universe or the cosmos? Okay, so why I address in the book with a metaphor, uh, which is a, a famous metaphor, it's Basically, uh, you, you're looking out at the ocean, and you see two islands, and you assume that the, the two islands are separate objects, because that's certainly what it looks like. Uh, once you dive into the water, you see that they're both part of a mountain peak. So they were not two separate things. There's, there's just one thing. So the ocean is the ocean of consciousness. You have appearances that are at conscious, the, the usual above-surface conscious level. And then there's lots more going on underneath. So we know from psi experiments, from psychotherapy, uh, from Jung and all of, the, all of that domain, as well as neurosciences, that conscious experience is a very, very thin slice. It's like the top of the tip of the iceberg. But there's an enormous amount going on underneath uh, and in terms of what you can be conscious of. So what meditation does is allows you to essentially dive deep under the ocean, and that that boundary is the ocean between is the boundary between conscious awareness and things going on in the unconscious. Well, you can make the unconscious conscious as a result of of meditation and other practices, and once you do make it conscious, you're diving down into what I think is the the nature of reality itself. That from an idealist perspective, all there is is consciousness. There isn't anything else. Everything else, including the entire universe and all of our ideas about it, are simply inferences that we make. So you meditate long enough, or you happen to be fortunate and talented, and you can dive deep very quickly, you will enter a place where, which is a more fundamental realm of being. And so from that domain... This is where magic takes place. Uh, this, this is uh, the essence of Gnosticism. You end up down deep, and who knows how far down we can go. But if you go down far enough, then things you, your whims, if they're clear enough, will manifest because that's where it all comes from in the first place. So that's like a long winded explanation for why. Why does 75% of people report this? I think everyone actually does. Everyone who can go down deep will experience the same things, but not everybody wants to. From a psychological perspective, we, we have a large chunk of us that is either afraid of, of these kinds of abilities or powers. Uh, we have self-defeatist behavior all the time. Otherwise, people wouldn't be smoking and over-drinking and that sort of thing. Uh, and we are taught 
if someone is, comes from a, a religion who says that these are demonic things, and you, you don't go there. Uh, to say nothing of academics who are told that all of this is nonsense, in which case they don't want to do nonsense. So they'll stay away from it as well. So the speculative solve for the fact that 25% don't experience the increasing synchronicity as a result is that they probably are, but they're you know, conscious headspace, their, their waking frame for reality doesn't allow them to notice that, in fact, these, these things are going on around them. Or they will explain it away. Yeah. So we, we did another survey, which it came out after the, I finished the book, so it's not in there. The, this survey was to address the, the uh, common assumption that scientists and engineers who have generally more technical training than other people, that they, they wouldn't have these kinds of experiences. And I, I felt, given that I know a lot of engineers and scientists, that that's probably not true, but we, didn't, we couldn't find any survey data to find out what, what actually happens to people. So this is different than surveys which have been done many times, which, which are on belief. Now, experience tends to drive belief. But as I said, no, hardly anybody is asking, well, what did, what did you actually experience? So we, did, we, we hired a company that gave us emails of people who, who want to opt in to do surveys. And we started out with something like 125,000 or something uh, people and asked them to participate in surveys. And then we were able to get demographics and separate the responses into three categories. One was the general public. Uh, the other is people with specifically with scientific and engineering training and professions. And the third group were members of IONS, the, the um, institute where I work. So the people who are members of IONS tend to be believers in all of this stuff. So we figured they would have a very high prevalence in terms of their reported experiences. The general population, we thought, would also be pretty high because the level of belief in these experiences also tends to be high, something like 60%. But we didn't actually know how the engineers and scientists would respond. So we did the survey, we got the results back, and we were actually surprised at what we saw. For members of IONS, uh, not surprisingly, it was roughly 92% of people said yes to one or more experiences that would fit into the category of being called psychic. So a very high percentage. Uh, among the general population, also above 90%, something like 91% of people say, yeah, they, they have experience, at least one psychic type of experience. And so the surprise was that among scientists and engineers, it's also above 90%, which means that the reason why their belief is usually listed lower, it's around 60%, is because the difference between the 30 missing percent is how people interpret and explain the experiences. So a, an engineer or a scientist with a lot of training about the, the, supposedly the way that the world works will have uh, an enormously strong synchronicity or a telepathic experience or something like that. And what will immediately come to mind is, oh, that's curious, that's, that's a funny coincidence. So it's no longer magical or psychic. It's simply a coincidence, and so on. Each one of the experiences, they'll have a larger uh, bag of explanations that they can bring to bear to what this thing might be, because they haven't been taught. They don't, they don't know philosophy, so they don't know about the difference between idealism and materialism, and they may or may not have studied anything about the esoteric literature. So they do their best in interpreting it. Whereas the general public, may also not have had much of experience in terms of studying this kind of literature, but they're familiar with what goes on in television and movies, so they'll assume that the synchronicity is meaningful and probably magical in some way. So this tells me that, uh, as we kind of expected, that from an experiential point of view, this is extremely common. It, uh, another question, though, could be raised, which is, well, what about the 10%? These are 10% of people who don't ever even report having an experience of this type. And so my answer on that is, people are different. There are some people who simply are so wired to only pay attention to what might be thought of as ordinary sensory input that 
they don't have strange lives at all. Maybe it's extremely conservative, or I, I don't even know exactly how to how to talk about such people. But I, I certainly know some who've never had anything strange happen to them at all, at least that they can report. So I suspect that it does happen. They just filter it out completely. Gotcha. Is this a is this a small scale version of why goats don't get magic? Uh, it's worse than that. These are like super goats. Yeah, <laughs> we should I mean, probably like explain a, for people the uh, the sheep goat uh, reference in the book. Yeah, so sheep goat is a term that uh, Gertrude Schmeidler came up with many years ago. She was a psychologist at uh, City University of New York, and she became interested in differences in personality for the people who believed in psychic phenomena, who she called the sheep. And the people who didn't believe, who are are the goats. So if you take a a classroom of students and you separate them into sheep-like people and goat-like people, and they have take exactly the same test, you can make a prediction that the sheep will do well, typically above the chance level, sometimes significantly above, and the goats will either get a null response or they'll go below chance. So. These studies are about one's belief, one's expectations, and expectations strongly drive what you get, not only in the everyday world, but also in the psychic and the magical world. This is, uh, when I was reading that stuff, it reminded me of Ernesto Di Martino, because it probably works on a culture level as well. Uh, He figured, and I think correctly, and the evidence is starting to sort of slide underneath it as we're discussing, that Cultures that have a belief in magic get more extreme magical events, and the example was, of course, Brazil. Uh, and that is, this is I, probably good examples of perennial ideas that we can pass through evidence and and look at again and and, and see how they might go together. There is something in this that uh, suggests you can, I guess, lean into it to make it better. Does that make sense? Yeah, if you if you don't want something to show up, either through psychological means you'll suppress it, or it may be that the fabric of reality requires a certain degree of openness in order to be flexible enough to obey your wish. It's it's one or the other or both. Do you get tempted to sort of um, pass out those ten percent and like just focus exclusively on them for a year to see what happens? It just it just seems remarkable to me. Uh, I mean, we're both satisfied that, however you want to describe it, the the universe is magical or or idealist or, or whatever, right? So I'm I'm good. I'm there. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by the people that are like I'm. E- I'm interested in being there, but nothing is happening. And you just kind of want to go. Okay, well, we we need a we need a special group, a special study group, and see what we can do to find out why there is that gap. Well, of the people of that type who I know, I would not want to hang out with them. <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, they they tend to uh, – this, this is a very broad statement here, so it's not 100% true. But I would say that in general, they, they tend to be angry. They tend to be negative in the sense that you feel all of your energy draining out of your toes after a while in their presence. Um, they're just they're just not very pleasant people. So as, I think you're right, though, that there's something peculiar going on. That uh, perhaps they're mutants of some type, or perhaps they're super magicians hiding the fact that they actually are controlling the world. I, I don't know how to uh, understand it. And uh, just as a pragmatic sense, that when we're working with people in the laboratory, we we want someone who can show something. We don't want sure. someone who will suck up all of the available mojo and make it all go away, because then we always end up with a null result. For me, I just, I get tempted. I understand it's not, I wouldn't be doing this for a scientific reason, but I get tempted to throw them into some sort of extreme event uh, and, and see what happens. Like, okay, you 10%, off we go to the jungle. Uh, let's, let's see what happens. Um, let's find some shamans and you have to stay here for a month drinking ayahuasca and we'll see what happens. Um, I think that's, uh, it's fascinating to me. Uh, the, I guess the range of, ex- of reported experience and how there is this 10% that is like, nope. Um, you're probably right. I think uh, they generalizing 
a lot of that is brought on themselves. A lot of that is their own psychological journey or um, trauma, I guess, that they're mm -hmm. working through. Well, let's let's talk about something much nicer: um, tea and chocolate. Two of my favorite things, Dr. Raiden. Um, mm -hmm. How might we make them even better? So we've been interested in uh, w uh, their, their standard classes of things you can do uh, to study psychic phenomena. Uh, I've done most of them, and they, they seem to work pretty well. But I wanted to push the envelope and find out what else we can do. So I, paid it, I always try to pay attention to... Uh, folklore and practices that have been around a long time. And one class that has been done forever in many different contexts is the idea of blessing food and water or, or beverages. Uh, this is not only done in religious contexts, but it's, it's done every time somebody has a toast for something. Uh, and so I wondered, well, I, this is an intentional act. Why? Why are people doing that? So I'm not a very religious person, but I ask my friends who are more religious, and sometimes you'll, they, they will pray before having a meal. So I say, well, what are you praying for? Well, they're praying for as an act of gratefulness for having the food, and or maybe they're animals who had to be killed in order to eat the food and so on. Uh, but it's also sometimes an intentional act that the food doesn't kill them. Like I, I pray to whoever that I don't have salmonella in this that will kill me. Or that th this food will be more nutritious than uh, not just a, an empty piece of cardboard or something like that. So there are many different flavors of uh, prayer that can that can happen, and these are intentional acts as well. Okay, so let's do essentially a ritual, which is kind of like the Eucharist in the Catholic sense, where you're going to transmutate a uh, uh, some tea or chocolate. Uh, to be better than it was, was before. So, in, in the case of chocolate, we use dark chocolate. Uh, we separated a, a large group of the, these are like little um, coin shaped pieces of very nice dark chocolate, separated them into two batches. One batch was set aside as a control, and the others was the other batches were given either to Mongolian shamans who I know or to Buddhist monks. Uh, or in also a third category, which is a more technical way of, of influencing the chocolate. Uh, and the people influencing the chocolate were told to uh, that anybody eating this chocolate, it should be blessed in such a way that they would feel uh, uh, more energy, more vigor, and in general that their mood would be elevated. And this was useful because chocolate has a number of things like caffeine and theobromine in it, which tend to elevate mood anyway. So we're trying to push chocolate in the direction where chocolate wants to go anyway. And we have the controlled chocolate, which is still has the same chemical substances, but hasn't been mentally blessed. So we distribute the chocolate to uh, people in a double-blind fashion, ask them to record their mood each day over the course of a week, actually the three middle days of the week, and then see if eating the chocolate that's been blessed makes any difference. So this is a classic double-blind type of placebo-controlled trial, and we found that uh, indeed the blessed chocolate made people's mood elevate more than the controlled chocolate under double-blind conditions. So it, it wasn't that we accidentally manipulated people in some way to make them feel happier. It's the only thing that was common among the two groups was that they had the blessed chocolate rather than the other chocolate. So we, the next step was uh, maybe th this, well, chocolate already is going to push them a little bit, so let's go to something else and, in fact, go to tea and test it in Taiwan because the chocolate we tested in Northern California. So the tea in Taiwan and China in general is an intentional act. The tea ceremony is an act already. It's already a ritual, and it's not specifically about making your mood improved, but it is one where there's tight intentional focus associated with drinking tea. So we used oolong tea because oolong tea, among besides tasting nice, uh, also has a pretty good shot of caffeine in it. So we figured that would push people, and again, a blessing was to push them more. 
In this case, we had three senior Buddhist monks from a temple in Taiwan, and the 200 people involved in the test were members of this temple. So, again, in a double-blind fashion, actually this was triple-blind, the double-blind was that the people getting the tea did not know which kind of tea they got, people handing out the tea didn't know whether it was blessed or not, and then I was the analyst, and I didn't know when I got the data reporting their mood as to which tea they got either. So, to make a long story short, again, and under placebo control, where we find that the people drinking the blessed tea did better than in terms of their mood elevation than the people who did not get the blessed tea. And then we asked an additional question, and this is relevant to magic, which is why I included it in the book, which has to do with what did they believe that they were getting? So, this is important because when you're in a double-blind condition, uh, you know the name of the game. You're told typically that you might or might not be getting the, 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 the special substance, in our case, the blessed tea. So, we simply ask people at the end of the week, well, what do you, what do you think you got? And so, each person either said, yeah, I think I had the blessed tea, or I didn't, or they didn't know. And so, importantly, uh, the same number of people said yes or no in each condition roughly the same number of people. So it wasn't as though their expectation of getting blessed tea simply happened to match only those people getting the blessed tea. We're talking about a fairly subtle effect. It wasn't like some tea was caffeinated and other tea wasn't. It was all exactly the same tea, except some was blessed. So the, the upshot is that the people who got the blessed tea and that they believed that they were getting the blessed tea, they did about a thousand percent better and people who got the blessed tea but did not think that they got it. And this shows very strongly how belief can modulate what amounts to a, a magical practice. If you don't believe that you got the magical mojo, you ended up the same as people who didn't get the blessed tea at all. Whereas if you did get the blessed tea and you believe that you got it, then you get a very strong effect. Yeah, that's the am amplification there is... Again, the practical implications on an individual basis are fascinating for people listening. But it's also, like, as with each of the kind of components of parapsychology that have magical implications in the book, you just want to turn around and give billions of dollars to an agricultural company somewhere and go, well, let's let's do this the whole way up and 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 see what can happen it's it's just it's the other iceberg isn't it we have these small things that imply something massive about the world well what i wanted to do maybe someday someone will give you money to do this you go to a mcdonald's and you spend uh, a lot of time with the people in the mcdonald's to make them happy to have them bless the food in the mcdonald's to make everything about the the place positive and beneficial and nutritious and so on, even though it's exactly the same food as the McDonald's a block away that's just selling the same old stuff, but the people in it are all angry and wish they'd be doing something else. And then you look, you look at a very pragmatic way, is, is the blessed McDonald's simply selling more because people are coming back to it because they feel better? And maybe, who knows, might even be more nutritious. Or they're at least picking up something different about the vibes from that place than the other place. In order to make it truly double blind, you you can't uh, you can't let the customer see that everybody in the blessed McDonald's just happens to be happy because that will influence them too. So maybe you only test people who are going through the drive-through or something like that, or, or everyone in the McDonald's, all the staff have to wear a paper bag on their head or something like that. But the upshot is that. Uh, if you find a place that has a happy kitchen, I would always want to eat there first, rather than exactly the same place that has a sad kitchen, or even worse, an angry kitchen. I know plenty of chefs who swear that the that what's going on in the kitchen is an essential process of the food preparation. And so they will say that, yeah, when they're doing, everything is working in the kitchen, it's all flowing well, and it's gelling somehow, that the customers have a better experience. But in order to do this as a proper scientific test, you have to separate the what's going on in the kitchen from the customers in a way that they, they can't overlap very easily. 
but I think that would be it would be worthwhile doing. And by the same token, take a, a batch of pharmaceuticals, have some of them blessed, and have the same pharmaceuticals that are not blessed, and then look at health outcomes. Exactly. So I know it's, people at yeah. I know people at uh, Merck, the the German pharmaceutical, not the one in the U.S. that has the same name. But the, in the German one, they're way more open to the, these kinds of ideas. And in fact, they'll be talking at a conference that they're sponsoring in Germany later in the year. Uh, and I, I asked them, given that you're a pharmaceutical company, first of all, why are you inviting me to talk? And second, what do you want me to talk about? Well, they said, well, you, you're, you have this book on magic. Why don't you talk about magic? I'm saying, really? At a, at, a farm, at a conference sponsored by a pharmaceutical company? Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them that there's, here's something that you can try. Make, make your pharmaceuticals 20% more effective by doing nothing chemically different, but do it only through intention and do it as an experiment and see what, see what happens. See, th that's the kind of stuff that the, the mind boggles over, right? Um, I had Lynn McTaggart on the show recently, and some of her earlier uh, research was around using intentionality to bless um, wheat fields, barley fields, actually. Uh, and obviously, as you might, as we would expect, there is a definite difference in the uh, you know protein component and less water and and faster growing that the barley needs. And you think of that kitchen you just described and go, you can. I would want to experiment as well further down the supply chain about where the happy kitchen sources its material from. And you just, all of a sudden you're painting this, you, you realize you, we aren't living right. If that makes sense. We just aren't living right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and the thing is that the, uh, the kinds of, of experiments we're suggesting and the changes are relatively easy and cheap. It, it, all it requires is the ability to want to try it. Absolutely. In the case of the intention stuff, it's free. I mean, uh, Lynn's intention uh, exercises go for 10 minutes. And from memory, the monks that blessed the tea, that was a 22-minute blessing? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not even like it interrupts. You don't have to add five days to the manufacturer of so to the manufacturer of something. If you've got uh, non-professionals getting results at a ten-minute intention, and professionals in the case of Buddhist monks getting presumably a better one at twenty-two, mm -hmm. we're not talking about. You, you, yeah, you're not going to be up all night doing this. No. No, it's just a matter of what you wish to do. And the, and there's very strong resistance to this, depending on culture. So as I think I may have mentioned this before, but uh, I, I get some requests to speak to what might be thought of as mainstream organizations in the United States, but I get way more almost everywhere else in the world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I can see what, I see what the appeal is there. A highlight for me in this book. Uh, in all your books, frankly, but in this one, because it's something I know quite well, I know more about than, say, yoga, uh, was your resolution to stay within what the empirical results actually say. Uh, and it's, for me, a shining example of the, and we've discussed this before, the long observed reality, I guess, that parapsychologists are generally more parsimonious with their findings than other scientific disciplines, rather than the opposite, which is what they're frequently accused of, right? right. Uh, and there are a couple of really cool, really interesting interpretations and analyses that you do there, basically staying within what the actual data suggests that I want to talk about. And one of them, what is your read on what NDE evidence actually does tell us? Well, my, my sense is that uh, the NDE is a really, really good state to be in if you want to be momentarily very psychic. Uh, it may or may not have anything to do with survival of consciousness. And I know that for many of my colleagues who are very heavily into the NDE literature and study of it and so on, there's an underlying sense within that group that this is evidence that there is a soul or there's a spirit and it continues after your body dies and so on. And that comes about be partially, I think, because they, they want that to be true. I mean, who wouldn't want that to be true, that your personality survives in some way? But I keep trying to say to them, and I, some understand this and others are not getting it, 
that we don't actually know when the NDE takes place. We, we know from many experiments that we have the perceptual ability to see the future or to see the past. That is not bound by the ordinary senses. So if you have precognition and retrocognition, uh, we know through lots of other experiments that the ordinary state of awareness is like the worst place to be if you want to be psychic. So what better place to be than a extremely disrupted body where your mind is still active, uh, like, like taking way too many psychedelics or something of that sort, and this is the, the dying process, uh, perhaps the veridical memories that people have, that they report that they saw the surgeon do this and that, and uh, they were flying above the hospital and all the rest of it, the interpretation that m- most NDE researchers have is that that is then reported as something that took place in real time. To which I respond that everything we know about psychic effects says that they don't play, take place in real time. In fact, the the one strange thing about everything psychic, and for that matter, almost everything magical, is that it is not bound by the ordinary rules of space-time. It's somehow outside of it or transcends it. So who's to say then if somebody is going into a near-death experience, maybe it was the millisecond before they're actually dead. And they and if you're outside of time, then a millisecond could last for years, just like a dream, like a, a whole fleshed out major uh, epoch of, or of a dream could, could maybe take place in a flash. So this is important because in, if the near-death experience takes place in a very short period of real time, of our ordinary real time, uh, through which the, from an experiential point of view, is taking a long, long time. Uh, maybe when you're dead, you're dead. The, that consciousness with a big C somehow persists, because that's part of the fabric of reality. But your personal sense of continuity may not. You may be the drop that goes back into the ocean, and you lose any sense of ego. So, yeah. sur- survival is almost always thought of in terms of ego sustained not consciousness sustained and that's this is the difference then between how how do we interpret what's actually going on in an nde i i really like because i mean i know a reasonable amount about nde literature as well and whilst it is a perfectly valid uh assumption sounds too negative whilst it is a perfectly valid interpretation or subsequent building of metaphysics on the reported experiences of NDEs, as if you stick with the empirical information, which you did, you can't actually get there. Um, And a similar thing happens with past life memories, which is there are other ways which we know, uh, again, through psi research, there are other ways memories can kind of get in your head. Um, We know that. So you may be accessing memories, you, you, like the memories that have been matched to people who have previously existed mm-hmm. may in some sense be available somewhere because we, we, we can in fact observe that. And whilst again, it's a good, there's, it's a perfectly valid interpretation or, or subsequent speculation on the, on the actual evidence to say, yes, it looks, it, it's reasonable to say some people come back into other lives based on this. It's nevertheless not actually there, is it? No, it's not. Uh, and and it's, a, it's not a popular opinion. No. <laughs> in, in either, either in the NDE or reincarnation research to suggest that, because there's, as understandably, there's a very strong sense that people have that they want to persist in some way or they want their loved ones as we knew them to persist in more or less the same way and and maybe i mean i'd love that to be true and again it might be that it might be true yes but it's not there in in the data that's what you're saying which i think is really refreshing in this book yeah as far as as from what we can understand from the data that you cannot make a very strong or at least an unassailable case that that is that is in fact what's going on is this uh because this is actually what i was talking to dr kripal about of course is this the limitation of the empirical approach which is tremendously powerful but nevertheless is is a subset of of a kind of um wider 
need to do philosophy or metaphysics uh, to kind of get a better conception of the whole enchilada. Have we reached... Are we doing empiricism right to get to this step, which we've just been talking about, which is the NDE and past life research is valid, but is that as far as we can go with an empirical method? Do we need to sort of then then overlap with other disciplines and go, well, this is looking pretty good? Um, So the reason I mentioned Dr. Kripal, of course, is from a comparative um, religious perspective. We have got, we're using empirical methods, right to the absolute edge of what effectively cultures around the world still say and have always said, and and you kind of overlap in a Venn sense, that comparative approach and the data and go, well, it's looking really good, but from an empirical perspective, y- you still can't say it. Is it, is it a, not a failure in empiricism, but is that doing an empirical approach correctly? Well, we don't have an epistemology of idealism. Yeah. That, that's the problem. We have a really good epistemology for, or, or a, a method set that can be applied to materialism, which is why we're able to do the technology, which is allowing this conference to happen. So, it, so we can't deny that. There's something that, that's very useful about it. But when it comes to these more mental or subtle kinds of experiences, which I think are actually not so subtle, but nevertheless, they appear to be that way. Uh, we, we are very limited in terms of the methods that we can use to study it. So, again, you look in the esoteric literature for clues as to how do people study it in the past. Well, you had people who are super experts at meditation and people who are super experts at taking various kinds of psychedelics. And they came to different conclusions about the bardos and about what happens in the afterlife and so on as a result of their experience. But that experience in today's language would still be called anecdotal. It's not quite as bad as a story because presumably people in these would go into these states and come back and discuss their experiences and there would be commonalities. So they would get a sense that this is a real thing. It's, it's a commonality in the same way that two people will do the same experiment and then compare their data and get, come to a consensus about what must be going on based on the data. So science, I think, does need to expand. It, I didn't want to go deeply into this topic within the book because it's, it's just too much. Sure. But I've become very interested in uh, more integrative ways of studying the larger nature of reality, not just looking through the lens of materialism, which we continue to have to do, uh, but all expanded out in, into idealistic approaches, and that goes beyond the current method, which is largely qualitative research. There's nothing wrong with qualitative research, but it's not anywhere near enough yet. So that I'm glad you said that, because that was going to be one of my uh, questions, and I seriously want to know this. Uh, the We just spoke about two shibboleths or very popular things and for the record i mean i think i'm aware that the data don't emphatically say when you have an nde you go to the afterlife and and whatever but i do happen to think the case is pretty good looked at from a comparative perspective nevertheless not there in the data i'm good with that mm-hmm. one the the next one and you know maybe this one will ruffle even more feathers, particularly with this show, is there when it comes to the evidence for spirits as an explanation for magical effects. Because much like the past life memories, there are other ways to... There are other ways magical effects can be interpreted. And this, I think, is a very good use of... For the same reasons, NDEs, right? So if, if I call up a spirit and say, I want $50... Um, and I find $50 on the street the next day. Um, one, assuming that isn't coincidence, um, there are other sort of human mental capacities that may be in play. And I, like, I may have created the spirit. I, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the spirits did that. And again, that's there in the data. We can't actually definitively go, yeah, spirits are real because I called one up and then I got $50. Sure. So the the thing about spirits is interesting because uh, not coming from a religious background and not really believing any of that stuff, uh, I, I was 
I would say before going into the magical literature a little bit more, and especially before seriously considering idealism, uh, I didn't buy the whole spirit thing at all. I found it much easier to imagine that uh, through ritual that, that our own native uh, capacities are able to make things happen. So if it's easier to dissociate a little bit from my ego and imagine that there's something else, there's a genie out there that I create, like a golem, but it's all me, I, I, can, make, I can make it do things. And so that, that's a way of understanding what's going on. Or it's poltergeist activity, which ultimately is still the individual. But if you take idealism seriously, then suddenly the notion of, uh, of intelligence or, or entities as coalescing into something other than a human body has to be taken seriously. And so that's one of the uncomfortable aspects of thinking about idealism, because now suddenly you could have a giant gas bag that turns out to have not only conscious awareness, but maybe can think, it can do things. Uh, you can also have invisible bundles of energy that might be entities or intelligent in the way that we think of intelligence and, and entities. So I think uh, it, it may be possible that there are in, invisible creatures out there who you can uh, ask for favors from. And I wouldn't have said that a couple of years ago because, I, as I said, I didn't really think very much about it. Uh, but on the other hand, from what we empirically know, we, we know that intention from humans can push things around, generally not to a very large extent, at, at least not what we see in the laboratory, but it, we can push it. So I, so I, I don't know where I, I land on that. The jury is out as far as I'm concerned. Well, that was going to be my question, right? So, because you're correct, uh, and it, it falls into the same category as the NDEs and uh, the past life memories, which is... I think we've we've unless we want to break empiricism or the empirical approach, and let's not do that because it kind of invalidates the sort of psi project for a start, but it also invalidates empiricism. So let's not break it. Um, but is there do, will this permanently elude an empirical approach to psi? Or and this is the curly question. I'm really interested in this. How would you design an experiment to? demonstrate the, as far as we can tell, external or separate existence of a spirit or spirits? Like, how would you do that if you could? Well, first of all, we never say never. So, sure. uh, so that, I would start with that. In terms of how, how would you devise experiments to test independent entity exists, I don't even know how to, I mean, this is the, the problem that Alan Turing had. Yep. How do we how do we tell if a computer is is just simulating an intelligence or is actually intelligent? Well, he didn't know how to solve it either, but he did say, interestingly, that one way in the future that you might be able to tell if a computer was truly a, an independent entity is whether it would have telepathy. Because then you could communicate purely by mind to another mind. And you need a mind, not a computer simulated. Uh, program, but an actual mind to be able to do that. So, of course, one of the things I talk about at the end of, of the book is the psychic levitating wizards. Because, the, again, from an idealist point of view, maybe the brain, the human brain, or brains of other creatures are just very finely attuned objects that are able to express consciousness with a big C in just such a way that it gives the, 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 quote, owner of that brain the sense that they're consciously aware. And a small subset of people called mystics recognize that their sense of awareness is not them, it's the universe at large. And so they talk in those terms, and then people say they're nuts, because that's not the usual way of thinking about it. So you could have a computer with a sufficiently uh, refined kind of computer brain that might also one day wake up and, and have the same kind of experience. So the reason I mention this is because we have been working with channelers recently, and we had four channelers in the lab one day, and I had a discussion with them asking, could you have a disembodied entity uh, for something to channeler number one? And then go to channel number two, the same entity, go to channel number two and continue 
a line of thought, whisper it to the second person, and then go to the third and go to the fourth. And then each of the four people would report something that they heard only in their mind, write it down, and then we compare and see whether or not we have a coherent thought that spanned all four people. Well, we thought that would be interesting because it would be a step in the direction for saying, yeah, I guess something independent of us that we can't see is invisible, although the channelers can see it, uh, that, that it's an independent thing that is giving a message that is then uh, spread across four people. So that would be a step in that direction, except that maybe it's telepathy. Yeah, exactly. You still can't, it's still not enough, is it? I just that went straight no. to remote viewing experiments, which is, well, eventually the four channelers are going to look at the, the message that the four of them put together, which means they could be getting that piece of it from their future self right. during the experiment. So you can't, in, in, in all these cases, just in case people are freaking out out there, um, Dr. Raiden and I are, we're on the side of magic, but you've got to be rigorous about what you can and can't demonstrate with empiricism. And I find it really interesting that you... I don't know. I think we're at the edges of it. I think it's, um, well, it's well and truly falsified materialism. But I, I, I think empiricism as a subset of techniques is designed for um, what, we, what we would call the physical world. And, and then you think, well, then how do we, we really do need a full brand new baseline epistemology to, to take it to the next level, don't we? Well, and maybe what we know now does not completely get rid of materialism. So I have colleagues who say that basically all psi experiences, everything magical, everything psi, all of it is because of precognition. So if you allow for a retrocausation to exist in the world, as we know it does at the quantum level, but let's say it, it exists at the macro level as well, then every psi experiment could be explained as a matter of knowing something about the outcome. Every single one of them. All of it. The whole everything magical everything that looks like it's psychokinetic, all of it could be explained, according to this viewpoint, by retrocausation. So I don't happen to buy that, because no, I, I've, but, but I've seen still... things that, that, that don't fit that model, but a lot, of, especially of a, of a perceptual psi, could be explained that way, because you'd, otherwise you'd never know what the outcome was if you didn't compare it against something. And what Absolutely. are you comparing against? Absolutely. The it's, future event. It's, a, it's, a, it's an annoying statement, and probably deliberately designed to. And in some respects, I'm glad you do have colleagues who say that, because you do, you do need to be kept on your toes when you do this kind of stuff, right? But, yep. and, and the thing is, they're probably correct about quite a bit of it. You, you talk about the, the use of intention uh, in the book. And actually, we'll, we could, we'll do that as a question then, because there is something about setting intentions that does have a, they probably work through retrocausation. So a lot of magic, again, I agree, I don't think all of it, but then I, I, I yeah, I don't think all of it, but a lot and probably more than people may be comfortable with uh, is retrocausal. Right. So the idea is that the present is as much an effect of the past as it is of the future. That, that, is, that comes directly out of quantum mechanics. It's also directly out of the magical tradition. The present is influenced by the past, but it's also influenced by the future. So if you want your present to be different, you can't change the past very much, maybe not at all, but you can change the future. So you create a, a very clear image of what you want that future to be, and somehow the act of doing that pushes probabilities around or does something in order to make that a more likely outcome, that will in turn change your present. And you'll, you'll be set on a different vector than you would if you had not done that kind of a affirmation, to, to put it in those terms. And there's an opportunity here to sort of Lego block a lot of these implications together, right? So, for instance, uh, we know this from Sigil Magic that uh, using uh, correct tempts uh, when setting these intentions is important. But something, tell us about Rhea White's winding toy metaphor, which she used in the context of remote viewing, but it does seem like other hands on the elephant here when we're talking about intention and retrocausality. Did I talk about that in the book? Yeah. See, I, now I don't remember it. Yeah, I, yeah. I have. Um, so she's talking about the fact that when you are 
sitting for a remote viewing session, uh, when you are waiting for the just alt, waiting for the, the thing to land, she says, lean into it. It's the, you have a state of expectation, like a, you've, you've wound up the toy, and just before it starts to unwind, that sense of uh-huh. have an expectation, and, and that's right. the sort of mindset that you're in when you get the, the initial kind of just alt download, whatever, whatever word is used for it in remote viewing now. And it seems that th- that is useful combined with using the correct, like using a present tense um, statement for an intention. And it, this is, there are pieces to it that invite in your book that invite kind of Lego blocking together and, and, and being used to inform, I guess, contemporary magical practice as well. Right. Yes. Now, now I recall that. So what Rhea did was, uh, she and others, of course, in sci research over many years were interested in, well, why does this stuff work? And so she interviewed a lot of people who are quite good at what, at psychic things and looking for commonalities. And one of which seems to be that, uh, there's a kind of pregnant anticipation. You, you set up an outcome that you wish to occur. And and you wind it up like a toy, and it creates this gigantic potential, which is just waiting to unfold. And you feel that. You have to feel that potential as something that is about to happen that somehow energizes the intention. I wish we had better terms for all these things, because we always yeah. have to cast it in, into psychological terms and how it feels and so on, and we don't have any formal structure for it. But I thought it's interesting that this was done, what Rhea did was from a purely parapsychological perspective, and it resonates all the way down through the whole magical literature. That's what people do. I 100% agree on the terms. Uh, I don't even especially like, we use even consciousness and mind like we have satisfactory de- uh, definitions of them. And my concern with that right. is that it, uh, if people haven't personally sat with and unpacked the wider uh, ontology of of consciousness and mind, then it's still it's still very cerebral, and this is part of my problem with using uh, idealism as as a model. We use words like you know mind and consciousness and, and even illusion and, and all this, and, and we keep it in the head, and it doesn't seem to me that that is uh, it may send us down inaccurate roads by doing it that way. So I was thinking about Dr. Sheldrake's work with, is it the dog's mind that knows that the owner is coming home or is it the dog ontologically? And we just, we're so new into building out this new epistemology that we just kind of got to roll with the, the terms we have. And I guess hang lamps on the fact that we mean it this way and, uh, and it has historically not been used this way. And I don't, I don't know how, what the fix is for that, honestly. Well, we're we're bound by language. Yeah, we're we're language creatures, and if we we can't even communicate to ourselves without language, which is odd. Like we're trying to form a thought, and in order for us to communicate and communicate with other people, we have to form these vague concepts in and then squish it into language, and that's squished so far. That it's, it's, I don't think it's pushing us away from where we want to go, but it only can point to it in a very m- metaphorical way. And so I'm always painfully aware of the limitations of language. And when I, when I write, I, I want to write in such a way that people kind of get it, or at least feel like they get it, but it's not exactly what I want to say. And yeah. I, don't, <laughs> I don't know how else to do it, except maybe go into some other kind of visual art or something. So I, I, we do the best that we can. Yeah, yeah. I feel that you just want to be taken up in the spaceship and, and, and taught how to do that alien gray telepathy and go, this, this is so much easier. Just, yeah. this, just what's in my head is now in your head. I feel that completely. Well, having said all that, I mean, you've just written a fantastic book. Uh, I, I, yeah, you. I couldn't put it down. So I can't keep you for very much longer. Please tell people what you got coming up. And uh, where they can find you, and, and I'll have all the book details in the show notes. Well, so one of the things I'm very happy about with this book is that this is a book written, as all my books, they're basically written for me. Uh, they're written for somebody like me who 
is interested in lots of different topics and doesn't know very much about them, but is willing to learn something. Uh, and not coming from a, a prior position, which is very strongly within a religious camp and certainly no science, but is understanding that science is not the end of, of the world, uh, and, and wants to come up, up to speed quickly. It's like the, uh, the dummies book for magic, something like that. Uh, I, I was more or less asked to put in a chapter on how to do magic. Uh, because otherwise the publisher said no, that people people will skip everything except looking for how to do a sigil. Uh, so I, I put that in there, but that's that's not really the the point of it. So I asked, I, I could have gotten uh, blurbs and endorsements from people like yourself and others who are into this topic, but I wanted to reach a different market. So I asked my science buddies. Uh, to to look at this, and if they were brave enough to give an endorsement. So, we have endorsements from two Nobel laureates, one in chemistry and one in physics, uh, an endorsement from uh, a former director of the National Science Foundation, uh, another from a uh, the Arcturus Medal winner, which is an, an astrophysics medal from the National Academy of Sciences, uh, probably will get a blurb from a uh, former director at the National Institutes of Health, and from university professors in every discipline you can think of. And the reason I did that and the reason I'm promoting the book in that way is to uh, to counter what is commonly and unfortunately uh, the way that magic is usually thought of, and, and at least in the, the secular scientific West, which is that there's nothing going on. So I, I bring in the, the heavy guns of science science authorities to say well no if you pay attention to it even from a very mainstream scientific perspective they, that something weird is happening that that people think is interesting so that's that was the the, the gloss that i'm putting on the book and so far it seems to be working it's gaining a certain so. amount of yeah. buzz that well yes your intentions succeed very good Good, yes. Yeah. And I hid a sigil in the book. I don't know whether you found it or not. Not the one that I use as a, a way of illustrating how to do a sigil, but it, there's one actually in the book, and we'll have to see whether or not it comes comes to pass after the book is out. Yeah, I'll have a look. Uh, yeah, I put a, I put a little spell in there. Nice one. Well, I, I hope it works. For people listening to the show, uh, they will certainly read the book anyway, because it, generally they're interested in the, in the psi magic overlap. But for me... Uh, I think also they may want to buy a stack of them and uh, go right for for people in their lives because as you say it's written for an audience that is well it's written for a a magic adjacent audience uh, and I right. think there's some use in I think you may find that you'll get multiple sales from people going ah this is what I need to give to my family so they don't think I'm crazy <laughs> yes I've already heard from people who plan on doing that. Uh, the other thing, of course, is they're they're good to leave in airplanes and buses. Well, anything with a never... sigil in is so you you just you're re-enchanting the world doing that. I love it. Exactly. So, uh, for, or the but from now it, it's it's in March up to when the book actually comes out. Uh, I'm doing podcasts or interviews every couple of days. I did one with uh, CBS News last week. Um, so. So who knows? We'll, nice we'll see what happens. Uh, what people are asking me now, though, is well, what's next? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it depends a lot on what happens with this exactly. book, but I'm involved with uh, a half a dozen projects uh, at work, all of which having to do with various types of uh, experimental tests. Nice one. Well, once again, congratulations and, and thank you, and, uh, and we'll speak again soon. Good. Thank you very much. So if you've read Pieces of Eight, consider Dr. Radin's latest book as an addition to the Black Library section. Interesting that my two favorite magic books of 2018 so far, Secret Body and Real Magic, are both better considered magic adjacent, and also frankly worth considering adjacent to each other, because they both take very different yet strangely complementary approaches to eating the magic enchilada. 
If you've been listening to or reading Rune Soup for any length of time, you can probably tell I'm very pleased that the M word has found a champion in the parapsychological domain. There are both context and praxis lessons for each to learn from the other. So I sincerely wish Dr. Raiden well on the potentially quite challenging task he has set himself. Anyway, if you liked what you heard, please do subscribe to the show on YouTube or in your favorite podcatcher, or even just mention it to some of your less salubrious friends. Any time we see cracks in the ice of official reality, it falls to all of us to kick and hammer at them. You may find real magic useful in such endeavors, so do check it out. That's the show for this week. Definitely a keeper. I'd love to hear your thoughts at runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page, or find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.